ten. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you here to our third and final annual lecture that is celebrating our 60th anniversary here in London at the Goethe Institute. My name is Katharina Ruckteschel. I'm the director here, and I'm really thrilled to have a very special person here, Matthew Herbert, who accepted our invitation for this uh, annual lecture. Well, we are delighted that you are giving a title that's called, or you titled it, Hearing Beyond. Um, with this talk, he invites us not only to listen to his words, but to sounds that may, be, that may have thought, that maybe we have thought, we wouldn't be able to hear, which is very complicated, I think. <laughs> we will <laughs> he will explain how this hearing beyond can reveal things about an exploitative and unjust economic system and how this can lead to meaningful action and even perhaps to change it. This sounds very exciting. A very warm welcome again, dear Matthew. I also want to welcome Sarah Meeks and uh, Paul Bryce Jones, who are again uh, providing ESL interpretation for any sign language users in our audiences here and of course online. But let me first give you a little background on Matthew, although I know, I suppose you all know his work. Um, well, it's not an easy ta task, though, as you have done so many different things, whether as musician, DJ, producer, or writer. In former times, one would have called you an universal gelehrter. I don't know if you understand that. I don't know the English expression, universal ge genius. Um, <laughs> People, people know you through some of your innovative works, uh, ranging from much celebrated album, bodily functions, music for theater, TV, games, and radio, to the scores for films such as uh, Life in a Day, or for several movies by Chilean director Sebastian Lelio, including most re recently um, The Wonder, which just won the British Independent Film Academy Craft Award for Best Original Music. Congratulations to that. <laughs> you have uh, remixed iconic artists, including Quincy Jones, Serge Gainsbourg, and Ennio Morricone, Morricone, and worked closely with musical acts as diverse as Bjork and Dizzy Rascal. But you also like to perform. Uh, this could be as DJ or as the Matthew Herbert Big Band, which became the Matthew Herbert Brexit Band for a special project triggered, triggered the looming Brexit. Over a thousand musicians and singers explored together what Brexit sounds like, resulting in the album The State Between Us. I think we all have to hear that, listen to it. Um, I think we all make also Brexit and sounds, of course, all the time. <laughs> for this project, you did much of what you have become particularly known for, making music from found sound. In this case, the sound of, for instance, a trumpet being deep fried or a swimmer crossing the English Channel. I suppose, suppose my little introduction makes not only you very, very curious about your talk. But before I hand over, I would also like to give a warm welcome to Ella Feiner, who will be the, in conversation with Matthew after the lecture. Thank you, dear Ella, for being here and contributing the, to this special evening. You work uh, in sound and performance, and in these areas you write, compose, and create, and do all this with a particular interest in how women's voice take up space, how bodies acoustically disrupt, challenge, or change occupations of space. In your research, you continuously query the ownership of cultural expression through sound. Recent projects by you are, amongst others, Her Moon in a Captured Object, composed for two stages, or Silent Whale Letters, a long-term correspondence project with artist Vibeke Massini, inspired by an inaudible sound recording kept in the British Library co simply called Silent Whale. I understood that it's only coming out now, or even next year. 
yeah, end of the year. Um, you have published various essays and currently finished your first monograph called Acoustic Commons and the Wild Life of Sound. We can see that you and Matthew will have many talking points and we very much look forward to your conversation. We also invite our audience here and online to pose questions after the talk. And of course, after that, we invite you all to our library upstairs, first floor for drinks and nibbles and further questions and discussions. A big thank you to our cultural um, department and the comms team and especially to Maren. And uh, of course, our house management and technical teams, Fabulous Ho and Anna. And now with no further ado, I asked Matthew to the stage. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, I should say thank you very much and um, to you and the whole of the Goethe Institute for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Matthew Herbert. I'm director of the Radiophonic Institute and I, I'm a composer and much of what I do is um, composed with sound. And um, a, a revolution has happened in my in my time, which is you can now make music out of anything. Um, as a consequence, things have shifted enormously. So um, you could make music out of a school shooting in America, the audio recording of that, but should you? What are the responsibilities that, that go with that and the ethics around, around that? I'm not gonna talk so much about that. I might hint at it later, but through this process of working with sound, I found myself in uncharted territory or in hearing things that no human has ever heard before. And it's an extraordinary um, feeling. You sort of feel like you should have someone somewhere will have experienced something. So my very first, um, uh, the very first recording I took was of an apple, uh, biting into an apple and then slowing it down and hearing the fibers tearing, and you realize it sounded like a, a tree being chopped down, and you realize, of course, it's just the same thing. It's the fibers and the cellulose pulling away from something. And uh, this, this messing with time, the slowing down of time, and like changing the materials of life, um, sorry, not changing, like working with the materials of life. And um, this led me on eventually to record um, three and a half thousand people biting an apple at the same time. And um, it took me a little while to work out that that's what I wanted to do. But, um, and actually it's an interesting thing, which is when you bite uh, an apple, <coughs> you know, it's very loud sort of sound, but actually what does somebody else eating an apple sound like? And it sounds like this. Like <laughs> and um, so you multiply by three and a half thousand and you get And uh, it's an amazing metaphor really for, for, light, for how we see ourselves, which is you know, the thing that we think is most important to us. Crunch, crunch, me. To somebody else sounds like, like a little thing like this. And I realized maybe I was the first person in the world to ever hear three and a half thousand people bite an apple at the same time. And um, so this, the possibilities of listening and using technology to listen um, unlock something really profound for me. And um, sound is a strange thing because it's in fact our, our oldest sense. So when we were just multi-celled organisms, the presence of another multi-celled organism um, through waves and movement, um, that's how we would have first notice the presence of something other. Um, and yet it's also our newest sense in the world, which we've, we've only spent, um, we've only, sorry, we've only had recorded sound for the last century or so. We've had the recorded image since cave paintings. But we haven't had the recorded image um, for more than a hundred years, uh, for, for less than a hundred years. So I'm a bit confused. I don't, don't really like this laptop thing. It's sort of, uh, anyway. 
I need it because I'm going to play you some, some sounds. Um, uh, but this, having only had it for a century or so, had a very fragmented approach to listening. And we can still see the same um, bias that you would see in any other archive, in a sound archive, about who has access to technology, where it was pointed, what sort of things were recorded. Um, so actually, even though we have sound recordings, we still have a very, very, we haven't scratched the surface of, of what it means to have recorded sound and how we should organize it. So for example, unless you're um, the king, there's probably not a recording of the street where you grew up on um, out there. Um, and say you want to move to a, a street um, next week, there's no way you can go to listen to that, that street either and hear the sound of it. How far away is the traffic? How far away is the train station? Um, can you hear the airplanes overhead? So it's a very new thing. We're still getting used to what, how we can organize it. And um, the thing that I love about recording is this idea of being able to separate your ears from your head, take them off and send them off around the world into dark corners and things. And sort of in a way, by recording sound, we're capturing something invisible. Um, in a way, what I'm interested in is the possibility to hear patterns, to render systems or render things around us that are invisible, the forces that act upon us um, or that we've designed to render them audible and in some ways visible, um, I guess. So for me, listening is about, um, or has increasingly become about understanding systems. Um, and I think this is particularly true because our own systems are our biggest threat right now. So uh, Naomi Klein says the thing that we have to do to guarantee our destruction is nothing. We just keep going exactly the way things are going. And you realize we've designed a system that to, do, to do exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, just food, for example. 30% of our food is wasted. And so if you think about, um, on average, there's around 136 million chickens killed every day. So 30% of those will never get eaten. So that's about 40 million chickens a day that are raised, killed, shipped around the world, and then buried or burned or wherever they, they might end up. It's an extraordinarily wasteful system. So I'm interested in what, how can we how can we hear that? And then and can we gain something from listening to that that we haven't previously ac been able to access? And Al Ann Balsamo is the former dean of the School of Arts, Technology and Emerging Communication at the University of Texas. And she talks about something called listening with technology. And I think that's something that I'm, I've found myself doing and that I'm interested in. Um, this idea of using the technology to be able to hear, for example, three and a half thousand um, people eating an apple, or if I could, 40 million chickens that aren't gonna be eaten today. Um, I'm sort of slightly regretting not bringing you three, the sound of three and a half thousand apples being eaten. That was an oversight on my part anyway. But so I thought we'd do some listening, really, and we'd, we'd try and cheat. So I'd try and do 30 years of what I've, what I've done, um, of my way of listening. Um, to try and do that in 25, 30 minutes. So we're gonna, we're gonna begin. So the, the first thing is, is um, Roland Barthes talks about, he doesn't quite talk about listening in this respect, but he talks about recognizing oneself in the space. And um, so I thought, well, the first thing we should listen to is probably this room. And so uh, this is this room. So that's all the little bits, all the little noises, all the switches and all the, the things that we could find. Just thought um, that was useful to me because I, I hadn't been in this room before. So I had um, somebody come and make those recordings for me. And uh, so what I've done is I've, uh, go back here. So I thought we should start by listening to this, listening to this room. So. First question then is, well, where should the microphone be? Well, I thought, well, I'm 
standing here. So this is um, this is what uh, I would be hearing <coughs> if this was last Friday. And then I thought, well, if somebody was in the audience, what are you going to hear? So if last Friday, if you were sat where that gentleman is um, at the back there, just in front of the mixing desk, this is from, if he was sat there last Friday, this is what he'd have heard. It's slightly different, believe it or not. <laughs> this is what I heard. That's what you have heard. Now, some of these are down by the window here, so this is what they'd have heard. So this is what I'm hearing. This is what they're hearing. And we're slightly, slightly closer to the traffic. You're starting to get a sense of structure and, you know, like some here being needing to be quiet or there being a, some sort of position of power being further away from something, being closer to traffic, things like that. So I decided to go a bit further um, in this. So this was recorded at exactly this time um, last week on Friday. So this is outside the building. Then this is uh, out the back by the bins. What's that noise? That's a really unpleasant noise. It's sort of got a high pitched whine as well. It's not a very pleasant noise. So I'll tell you where this one is. This is around the back of the building. child's voice is useful here because you can start to hear it echoing off some of the spaces. We begin to get a sense of, uh, we begin to be able to build up a picture that we can hear a lot of traffic, but there's also a child playing, so it feels relatively safe. You can hear the sound bouncing off the walls and things. But this sort of, this, this, this rumble um, in a way. So what about 6.30 last Friday, but 10 miles away? This is 10 miles away in London at the same time. And then this is my studio, 60 miles away at exactly the same time. Now, I live on a farm. Um, it's very beautiful. It's been there since 1600. It's on the marshes. It's very beautiful. This is what it sounded like. You hear this presence of cars and rumbling, even though whether we're in the city, whether we're inside, even, you know, we can... Once we go back to the window, you can hear it rumbling away out there. And then here we are, um, back in my studio, it's still there. Okay, Bristol, we've now moved uh, 100 miles away. This is still 6.30 last Friday, 100 miles away. This is Berlin. 580 miles away, 6.30. And then let's keep going. Milan, 590 miles away. Barcelona, 700 miles away. <laughs> 
Turkey, 2,000 miles away. This is still 6.30 last Friday. They're having a bit of a party in Turkey. Okay, Brazil in uh, Sakarima. That's nearly our first bird, actually. Let's keep going. Japan, 6,000 miles away. Believe it or not, this is my friend who lives halfway up a volcano on, <laughs> on his balcony. I don't know what he's doing, but... Chile, 7,000 miles away. Australia in Sydney, 10,500 miles away. And then this is all of them playing at the same time. doesn't sound it doesn't sound positive it doesn't sound like um, yeah it's difficult to work out I mean who are these people I mean one of these people I can tell you is well we can say, we can say that it's not probably not Ukraine right now because there aren't explosions and there aren't um, things like that but there is a um, one of the person people that made that recording for me um, is a Russian exile who fled Russia um, just as the war started, so that's his recording. So, starting to when you start to layer these up, when you start to think, we, we start to hear on a, on a bigger scale. Things start to fall into place. You start to realise, oh, maybe there should be a different way of of it. So this is um this is a piece that I did last week, which was made out of um, every sound. Um, inside and outside of Lakeside Shopping Centre um, in Essex. that I, I worked on a film um, called Life in a Day where we asked everybody to send us their favorite sounds. Um, and the, uh, the first 465, I thought, oh, I wonder what happens if you play every, the first 465 sounds that I was sent, if you play them all at the same time. And this is a sound that, in a way, changed my life, I, I think. I think it's extraordinary these are people's favorite sound so this is the thing they like the most in the world played at the same time For me, that that thing is happening for me where you start to be able to hear a system. You start to be able to hear that this is an unhealthy situation that we're living in. This is an extraordinarily um, awful thing <laughs> to hear. Um, so I filtered it to try and listen to it differently. So this is taking out all the low frequencies.
we realize maybe uh, maybe the lower sounds are the things that are, th are the things that we find unpleasant maybe it's maybe it's easier to cope with these higher higher sounds um, also it sort of reminded me a little bit of a pond so here's a recording of a pond A little, this is available in the British um, Library in their sound archive. And then I heard a sound last week recorded by my friend Julian Sartorius, who's a drummer, and um, he's an extraordinary drummer, and for some reason, I'm not quite entirely sure why, but he played the same part for 10 hours continuously. Um, he stopped for two or three minutes just to eat and drink, but he played outside on the roof. And then um, this is it in a minute. You'll hear 10 hours of drumming in a minute. <laughs> like, we, <laughs> like we can hear his breaks. <laughs> And then it goes back to how it was. I did a project um, at the uh, Welcome Collection um, with the Royal Opera House um, as part of an exhibition called This Is The Voice. Um, bless you. And the, uh, um, we asked everybody to sing a single note as they went through the, um, uh, they came, as they came to the end of the exhibition. And then we took their voice looped it and added it to everybody else that do had done it. So by the end, we ended up with 23,000 people singing at the end. And so this is a, a note of their choice. So this is, this is 23,000 people singing. me a little bit of this uh, out by the bins <laughs> um, uh, I uh, I worked on um, I didn't have a particularly good experience with the director um, on life in a day part two um, um, but one of the really exciting things about it which sadly didn't end up in the film uh, was we went into all 365,000 um, uh, submissions that were made for the film. The film was made and assembled out of um, out of films recorded all on the same day. Um, and I worked with a computer programmer called um, Dr. Matthew Yee King at Goldsmiths University and uh, Dan Jones, and they wrote a script for me that pulled out. Um, every sound that happened in that day that was sent to me, um, it was a B-flat. So it could be a cockerel, it could be a car. A lot of it was human speaking, a lot of it was things. But this is it. This is all the B-flats on the 25th of July, Intense. I'll stop there. Um, from the same project, this is uh, how many people? Uh, this is two, three, sorry. This is 2,425 people laughing. <laughs> And then uh, this is from a different project using the same um, technology for a different project. Um, this is 3,000, actually this is 23,000 dogs.
last one. And finally, some people coughing. <coughs> 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 I feel sorry for the small child at the end there. Um, okay, so so now that you've heard what I've heard over the years, now I sort of want to go beyond that, really. This is the bit that I'm interested in, which is um, having a sense of what the world sounds like, having things, how do we hear beyond that? So I think the first thing I'd like you to do um, uh, is listen to your breath as it goes up um, your nose and back down it. You should be able to hear it just a little bit against some of the hairs on the inside of your nose. And now that you're breathing, I'm going to try and sort of hear across borders. So uh, right now, there's somebody that you're you're breathing at the same pace that s as somebody who's asleep now, and that person has got school exams next week. Now, with that same keeping that same rhythm, that same uh, that same in and out at that same pace, you're also breathing at the same time as somebody who's on a bus in the dark, going to work to build a bit for a car that you're going to ride in one day. Who's playing? Oh, they are. <laughs> really grateful that you came here <laughs> and not there so thank you very much so I'd like to try and go back to the person on the bus in the dark who's going to work I'm going to try and hear inside the bus engine like which bit of the engine are you going to listen to would it be a, a little thing that clicks or is it right inside right inside the the engine as the pistons going around, is there oil sloshing around in the in the inside? Is it raining? Might you hear windscreen wipers going at the same time? I'd like to listen inside all of the bus engines in the city or the country that you're currently imagining. And then the dust grows and grows. It's swirling now, recorded binaurally. It blends into the sound inside a 10-year-old bag of a never-emptied vacuum cleaner as it sucks up grit and cat hairs. It's now a roar, a rumble. We hear now from inside another vacuum cleaner, this time a handheld one, sucking up bits of old food and stray Lego hands from underneath the child seat in the car. Then we're inside a hand dryer at a one-star hotel. Then we're inside the air conditioning piping in the channel tunnel. Then we're inside the heating ducts of a temporary structure hosting a wedding for a TV celebrity. Then we're inside the chest of an asthmatic boy. Then we're inside the nearly finished dome at Chernobyl listening to air being sucked out and recirculating through pipework. Now we're inside the exit pipe leading from a tumble dryer in a laundrette in Liverpool out of a window on the 13th floor. Now we're inside the throat of a smoker as they inhale on a pipe while watching the news in Gambia. Now we're inside a pair of bellows operated by an elderly man on his knees in front of a failing fire. Now we're inside a huge Catholic church organ as it starts to warm up and air passes. Now we're inside the nose of someone getting CPR. Now we're in a fan heater as it heats up a disabled person in a garden shed. Now we're inside a Malaysian Airlines jet engine at takeoff. Now we're inside the fan on a laptop. 
Now we're by the ear of a sound engineer. She listens to the sound of wind whistling through the ribcage of a dead animal in the highlands of Scotland. Now we're inside the fan of an ice cream freezer in Israel. Now we're inside the chest of someone in the back of a lorry struggling to breathe. Now we're inside the crematorium, uh, the cremation oven that may burn the body of Henry Kissinger. Now we're at a country fair inside the pipework of a steam engine once used to run a cotton mill near Rochdale. Now we're in a van's ventilation system on the way back from the mines. Now we're the air leaving a football as it's kicked. Now we're in an extractor fan in the first class toilet at 37,000 feet. Someone you'll never meet at a factory is making some clothing for you. What can you hear of them? Can you hear the machine? Are they sewing? Are they putting in the zip? Are they putting in buttons? Are they putting in poppers? Now can you hear everybody that's making clothes for you right now? Clothes that you might buy soon or in five years' time? Can you hear the whole textiles industry? The whirring and the bobbing? Can you hear it breaking down in landfill? All the stuff that's not there is now buried underground. It's oozing. Is there an ooze? Is there worms going through it? Are there beetles? Is there scruffling like the pond that we heard? <coughs> Those noises. Who's dealing with all of this shit that we're making? I think hearing it helps to render it more comprehensible, somehow capturing the, the invisible. Levina says there's no transcendence without ethics. So back to the breath in your nose, the breath of someone is breathing maybe at the same speed as you, someone who's going to clean this room tonight. The breath of a young woman in Iran who will be beaten tomorrow. And when you can hear this, you know that we're united, we're bound together. The lungs and breath of one of those Brazilian birds we heard. The horse in a field, all breathing the same air as us, we're all connected. Bart says, listen to me means touch me, know that I exist. I'd like to thank Patrick Larkond and Dan Pollard, Jan Sesnick, Matthew E. King, Brad Acton, Dan Jones, Julian Sartorius, Hugh Jones, all the contributors who recorded for me, and you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, a shameless plug, but the bit was from um, my book, which is a whole, um, which a description of a record I'll never make, and that's part of the that's part of the chapter. So, thank you. Maybe we do. <laughs> I I wasn't expecting you to end, so I was like in a kind of just closing my eyes listening to you talking and then you thanked everyone and I thought this is it <laughs> but I'm so thrilled that was absolutely amazing um, a kind of extraordinary journey through sound and I have so many so many thoughts and so many questions and comments and and I'm sure everyone else here does so we can perhaps talk for about 10 minutes and then open mm. out to anyone who el else who has a question and maybe instead of me kind of closing down any quest on any question, I could just give you a few of my thoughts and you can choose which of them you'd like to pick up on. Because I was so, I was so struck when you were taking us to all these places um, so fast, actually, with such pace, inviting us to be inside fans and freezers and, and other people's bodies. And I thought, my imagination goes faster in vision than it does in sound. And that's, of course, my subjective experience. I don't know how it was for other people, but I go faster in vision. And I don't know in, in imagination. And I love listening. And um, I, I, I love a kind of the attending to things through listening. But when you're giving us that, um, all that information, I go to vision, so immediately I see it. And then I'm trying to listen, but then you've taken us somewhere else. So I was thinking then about 
kind of taking time to attend to, to sound and how we actually have to take time. So I, in listening to you sitting there, um, once I hear the football next door, of course I can't listen to both at once. It's a practice of select, it's a selective practice. And there's an ethics in that as well. And maybe you'd like to talk to that. Um, I was also thinking about as we move um, from s for the 6.30s, how, of course, we're moving as well through time zones. So we're hearing also not 6.30 <laughs> everywhere. We're hearing these different parts of the day. And I wondered when you also took us, um, we suddenly heard birdsong, if that was then another part of the day. And so, in fact, it's this kind of collapse then of all these, of, of night into day and all these kind of different conditions. Yeah, that was a, a friend uh, a friend of mine who was on a Brazilian retreat in the Amazon and um, working with some indigenous people. And it was so shocking after hearing all the other sort of <coughs> sort of thing yeah. to suddenly hear just birds, even on my farm. You know, we've got a lot of bird life around. We're lucky. Mm. But just uh, I was quite shocked when I listened to my own recording because I'd normalized it. I'd normalized this hum, this sort yeah. of hum of consumption and engines and motors and this mm. churn of um, shit, really. Uh, there's no other way of putting it, of just making things, using them a bit, throwing them away, burying them, or you like growing chickens, not eating them, burning them. You know, just this this cycle of, of destruction, you know. Isn't there something called the great hum or the... I'm sure other people in the room know this better than me, I don't, but the, this kind of um, phenomenon that there is this hum that some people can tune into. So we're talking about sounds, or you're talking about sounds brilliantly, that are kind of out of human range or out of our range or beyond hearing. And, um, and, and this is one that kind of some people can tune into, which speaks to also our conditions of hearing. Yeah, and there, there is, um, there's obviously background hum from space, there's all sorts of um, sounds that we're hearing and different kinds of um, sonic um, information that we're getting from um, a whole variety of things. I did learn something extraordinary the other day, which was that um, bees uh, in the hive, when they're humming, hum at exactly the same pitch as the rest of the universe, which is like really extraordinary little tiny detail you think well once you know it you're like oh of course they do but you know that oh, idea that's so lovely isn't <laughs> it that's so lovely because that was something i was thinking about when you were talking is about kind of i guess sympathetic sounds or, sa or the kind of trickster nature of sound which i guess you know we're always kind of caught up in this game of resemblances with sound and it was made so explicit by the, the brilliant interpreter here that if you hadn't for example named something as dog would we have got the gesture of dog? Or would we have got um, a, some other kind of interpretation of what that sound is? You know. And when you layer up 23,000 of them, it starts to sound very, it starts to sound very strange. And Dogs. Yeah. yeah. They sound underwater. Yeah, well, I put them a little underwater. That's to try and help me listen as <laughs> well. So I started underwater oh, right. so that otherwise it's just... <laughs> for like two minutes. And so for me, it's, it's, um, it's a way, you know, like these sounds, I'm still, I still don't know what to do with half of them. I still don't know what to do next. Um, yeah. I, did, I did a, particularly when it comes to recording and the ethics of working with some of these sounds, if you don't, um, if you don't own them. I was once um, sent the sound of somebody being shot um, I asked people to send me their favourite sounds and their most hated sounds, and somebody sent the sounds of them being of somebody being shot, and suddenly I was in my studio and not knowing is it appropriate. I don't know anything about this person, this situation. And suddenly, I'm 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 there. I'm embedded in this political and social situation, and um, so that act of what you then do with these recordings or what your responsibilities to other people, I think, are really um, challenging and interesting. 
They are, and I know that you've also you also talk about this a lot and think about this a lot. And um, in fact, when we first met, which was actually the last time we met, the only other <laughs> time <laughs> that I've met Matthew, um, it we it was at the British Library, and it and there was a whole conversation about whether to whether to play something about actually the kind of responsibility and whether to make audible again the recording, and. Um, and I guess I had a question um, before opening out to others' questions about recordings and and whether also you work with live and with live streams, because in particular when you were playing all these sounds at once, I was thinking of, say, platforms like Locus Sonus that enable us to listen in to multiple places across the globe kind of at the same time or kind of in correspondence or sequentially. And there's that, um, I mean, that kind of impossibility and that illusion that we're listening to now because, of course, there's a delay and, of course, um, you know, there are other factors in, in the medium um, kind of altering the time sense of that. But I wonder, what's your commitment to the record? Because it does come through very much and you're talking about it. There's something about the collection of sound like your ar your own personal archive of sound. So I'd really like to hear you talk about that. Well, it's, compl it's complicated as you allude to and what I didn't talk about there, which I could have done another, um, or we could have talked a, a lot about, is about the, the format and the medium itself. Some, was, some were recorded properly, some were recorded on mobile phones. Um, and so you have a lot of different um, uh, perspectives on that, um, a lot of different parts of information going into the recording. So it's not like it's a version of the truth necessarily. It's not, this is exactly what happened. But I think, um, I think there's something about trying to decode it for me that I find really interesting. So um, the very first recording that we listened to it feels like nearly silence but me standing at the lectern actually you could hear a little girl outside and you suddenly got a sense of uh, oh that you're not entirely alone you're not in a soundproofed theater um and i i am and i i'm so in love with this idea of being able to bend time and to render it somehow pause being able to stop it and to make, make sense of it. And one of my favorite ever recordings, I've never heard, um, but it was, on, it was on Radio 4, my dad told me about it. It was a program about archeologists um, talking about um, uh, ancient Egypt. And they realized that um, the potters wore, wore jewelry and they were working their pots on wheels and they, what they were trying to do was use, basically as the pots turned, their hands became like crude uh, record players or recordings, recordings the sound of ancient Egypt. So what they were trying to do was use, find a way to get a stylus of some kind to play back these pots. And then you suddenly get to hear the sound of ancient Egypt and it makes you, when you, when you hear the about the possibility that we could hear ancient Egypt, you just realize how silent history is. Yeah. You know, you just realize it's completely, we think of it as noisy because we've seen all these images and we know and there's buildings and things, but actually we don't know what the past sounded like at all. We've got no sense of that. And, and I think it's particularly, it's particularly a hard thing to think about now as well, because how do you listen to an absence, you know, when there's a, a huge biodiversity loss. I mean, we listen to all those recordings, but actually there are huge absence of birds, of mm. other animals, of trees, of the things that we depend on to, for life and things. And so how do you listen to an absence as well? So this, I sort of hold on to these recordings as a way of trying to keep listening again and try and find more information in it that I can. So going back to them and kind of, yeah, you, you can really hear it in your work, this commitment to going back to them, because I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I have a lot of 
voice memos and a lot yeah. of recordings that I don't think I'll ever listen to again. No. And I think of those and storage banks. And, you know, every image of a storage bank, I'm so strong, I'm a bit obsessed with images of storage banks because they're always these kind of shots of shelves going, 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 going into this kind of very kind of exact perspectival distance, shining, gleaming. You mean the servers that are keeping yeah, servers. all our digital stuff? And it, on, yeah. yeah, and I kind of look at these and think, yeah, it's kind of infinite, and it's actually scary how much you know we rely on these, and they're so invisible as well. So we're talking about absences and what's inaudible, and also kind of what's invisible that we rely on to also keep what's largely inaudible to us. Yeah, and, and they're burying the servers in the sea to keep them cool and things yes. like that. And you just think all the all the noise pollution and it's like, you know, there's this um, study a new scientist uh, came out a few weeks ago. It, it actually made it to the the news. You might you might have heard about it, but the um, coral reef. They were playing the sounds of a happy, healthy coral reef to the coral reef, and the coral reef responded and grew better and did better through hearing through hearing the sound of a healthy coral reef it that it started makes me really emotional <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know partly that makes me really emotional because <laughs> recently to kind of give you a story as well um in in return for your amazing stories is i've been working with um a curator a curator the mammals curator at the natural history museum and with the whale um whale skeletons and he said, I have to show you something. And he was so, and he hadn't told me about it before. And um, he took me to this very kind of, it almost looked like a 1960s kitchen cabinet. <laughs> and then I opened it up and inside were these long, um, long cylinders of wax. And he said, these are the wax earplugs from a whale. Um, and can you see those dark rings in them? So this is like, if you imagine, almost a kind of candle shape. And then inside, there are very, very light rings in this candle, and then dark rings. And he said, those rings represent um, the cortisol, the stress hormone. And where the dark rings are, are when the world wars were. They're when um, aggressive whaling happened. They're when um, military experiments started happening with much more frequency. And he said, this is history recorded in the whale's ear. And it just struck me how much we just really don't know, you know? And this is how much we really don't know, but also we really can't hear. I mean, we're, we're looking at that and we think we're, we're in a way through looking at that, we're hearing what a whale has perceived, perhaps in, in another sense of hearing, not as obviously as we do. But, you know, your coral story just made me think of that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. There's that amazing... Bio anyway, we should... Uh, Both. Just watch the <laughs> um, I can go off because I'm making a record out of a horse skeleton. I know, moment, I know. So well, maybe you could tell us about the horse skeleton and then we can open up to uh, questions after you tell us about your horse skeleton. Um, I, uh, I bought a horse skeleton on eBay of um <laughs> of an ex racehorse and um and I'm doing the story of the musical imagination from bone flutes up to tech up to modern and electronics. So at the end you'll pick up a bone and it will play the sound of the horse running free. But at the beginning you sort of blow through it. And so I went to the caves in northern Spain with some of the world's oldest horse drawings and recorded um, recorded there. Um, but I was spending a lot of time with the skeleton and it, it reminded me of um, this horrific story about Harris lines, which are a thing in forensic bones, which is um, this child was murdered and um, they could tell w the year that he was abused because of the stunted growth, a bit like the whale, the way the trauma was embedded in the bones as he grew up. And they managed to trace it to when his grandfather visited, and it was his grandfather abusing him. And this, this capacity for the body to remember, and um, so it's a bit of an oblique angle, but it reminded me of your whale ear, um, ear thing. But this, 
yeah, anyway, we should talk about something more cheery. But the horse will become then an album, because the musical... Yeah, so it starts, uh, it starts and, and actually what I realised was, in a way, um, because you start with music as in form of Impressionism, the bone flutes are like... <laughs> um, and you finish with the horse up and running again. Um, in a way, you're bringing the horse back to life through music. So I'm trying to revert, I'm trying to do a version of the coral reef okay. type thing, I guess. You know. Wow! If you manage to make that horse live, you'll be. <laughs> 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 I'll be back here. You, you'll definitely be back here. You'll be everywhere. Um, but let's. Um, <laughs> now I'm just imagining that happening because Matthew did show me a picture of its bones. Um, but would would anyone in the audience like to ask Matthew a question? I'm sure. There are so many thoughts going around. Let me put my glasses on, actually. That might help. Here's a question here. Hello. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just uh, struck by the listening to everything or like many things all at once and kind of wondering about the questions of representation or like what's being represented there because I kind of thought if you listen to or look at or even just imagine lots of stuff at once, it always becomes horrific. Because you, you played the, the favourite sounds and then thought that that, look, that sounded awful. Um, but I'm just, yeah, I'm curious about that kind of act of representation and it, whether you see it as neutral or... Um, it's, it, it's definitely not neutral, and I think it's a, a valid question. I think these are all um, these are all sort of baby steps, I feel. I feel like I'm right at the beginning of something, so it's sort of trying to understand it. But I, I do think that um, when you look, for example, at... Um, do you know Bernie Krauss? Um, so Bernie Krauss... Um, He's written a book called The Great Animal Orchestra, and he records a lot of um, rainforests and things. And he has a very... Um, uh, he has these amazing recordings, including all the spectrograms of the frequencies. And he talks about a representation of harmony um, in as much as every animal and plant has their frequency, if you like. Um, so they're all... They're all represented, and they, all, you know, by finding a little slot in the thing, that they find a place for for all of them. And I think that's what's really um, that's what struck me strongly is this idea of um, what might a harmonic soundscape be for us, um, because we can't just do everything that we want all the time without consequences. <laughs> So we have to adapt, we have to change our behavior fundamentally to do that. So is there a clue in that, is there that a clue in that, in the spectrogram of the rainforest with everybody with a, a little frequency or a part? Um, so a really good example of that would be, right now car manufacturers are artificially putting sounds in their cars because electric cars don't make a noise. And we got in touch with some of them from the Radiophonic Institute, and we said, can, it's up to you what you do, but can you at least make them in the same key? Make them in the key of G, so traffic starts to sound, <laughs> instead of awful, maybe something a bit a bit calmer or a bit purer, but they weren't that, that interested. Um, I also approached uh, white goods manufacturers, like a washing machine, because I realized the other day a washing machine is just an album. Um, it lasts about 70 minutes. <laughs> It starts quietly, it's got a peak in the middle, <laughs> it drops down a bit, then has this huge surge at the end and then dies off. And you just realise you're just listening to an engineer, you know, a cycle of engineering. So I said to them, well, can't we create uh, something pleasing about that? You know, can't we, can't we have a p an opinion on that? Why don't you work with us to help shape that? And what happens when your washing machine's going, but then so is your cooker. And then your toaster, is there a way that we can, again, create some sort of harmony about it? So I think you're, I think you're right to question whether it's just um, 
whether it's a sleight of hand or something like that, or whether it's, you know, your, but I think there's something really, um, I think there's something really fundamental there, which is no matter which way you dice it, it's, um, it's, uh, it creates discord, it creates discord. And so in a way, I guess the next th step would be for me is thinking about, well, how do we order organize ourselves harmonically um, and not just doing whatever we can, you know? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think my fear or concern is sometimes where it goes towards just like there's too many people. You know, there's too much. Oh, good. No, yeah. no, it's definitely no, no. It's not. A, it's not about that. It's about consumption, and it's about lifestyle, and it's about um, people like me flying around the world and having access to unlimited stuff in supermarkets without any sense of where it comes from. Um, yeah. Question down here. Oh, there's a question back there. Then the best one. Matthew, I'm surprised they're not interested in, in listening to you about electronic vehicles because they spend so much time tuning exhausts. <laughs> yeah. um, you're, you're raising um, sort of ethical and moral dimensions of music and what should be done and shouldn't be done. It seems to me one of your most affecting pieces of, of making the almost the ungraspable real was the wonderful piece you did about um, the Iraq war where you... You started off with the idea that one note would represent one death, and then you realized that it would be too long, and then you have to be have one note would represent 100 deaths. And I think you ended up with one note representing a thousand, one beat well, representing a thousand right. deaths. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in, in gestures like that, you are making, you are answering some of the questions you're raising. Um, yeah, I'd forgotten about that, actually. Yeah, I, I think... Um, yeah, it became like a sort of sonic war memorial, but it was also yeah. utterly devastating because it had to go so fast to, for the number of deaths that it ended up just being boop, almost like a continuous, um, a continuous tone. And um, thank you for raising that because actually, in a way, that's I guess that's what sound has created the possibility for me and other anybody else that wants to do it. Um, with technology, like listening with technology, like you being able to hear and comprehend in a different way. Your point about the visual imagination um, is an interesting one because we process sound six to eight times faster than the image. So it goes straight, it goes much quicker to different parts of our brain. We process it much faster and we process the image 23 times faster than text. So if you're just reading then sound is way faster than than than, than reading um, text, and um, so this capacity to understand really big numbers or really scales of things or the horrors of the Iraq War, I think for me feels like a, a liberation of materials that hasn't really been grasped yet. I think by the wider music community, it still seems we're seduced by me included, seduced by drum machines or guitars or um, or synthesizers or, or, or whatever, but actually we've got this whole new material to work with. Well, it was a deeply affecting piece, and I thank you. Oh, thank you very much. There was a question down here at the front. Thank you for your... Yeah. Did you still have your question? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, both of you. Um, yeah, this goes back a bit, you're what you were talking about before, and this, um, you know, layering of um, many thousands of the same sounds, because it, it, like you kind of said, it, it well, it, it seemed to me that a lot of them, um, everything just, it wasn't enhanced, it became very indistinct. And I think that because of this whole thing that humans obviously aren't very good at finding the different places in the spectrum. And interestingly enough, the one that had the most sort of variety and clarity seemed to be people coughing, which was quite interesting. Um, but um, in, in, in the piece that was um, all the sounds in a day, it sounded to me very like one of my favorite sounds, which is pachinko parlor. Um, so, you know, if, if you're familiar or not with it, it's a 
Japanese amu sort of amusement game where you have thousands of ball bearings rattling around and lots of electronic music and, and then a sort of this huge hum of background hum. And, and I wondered in that, um, it, it seemed like if there were all these thousands or hundreds of thousands of sounds that a lot of them must have been stuck in this sort of human inability to find a place, but maybe very few sort of contributed that sort of nice high-end variety. I wondered if you had any idea what, what sort of how it sort of broke down in a very general terms into sort of distribution of sounds. What was going on that made it sort of seem like that? Um, I, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to know. I did listen to all of them individually and it was from 2010. So I, I, I'm struggling to remember. There was, a quite a, there was an awful lot of people making coffee. Um, so there's probably a quite a lot of metallic and teaspoons and things like that of, of coffee making and, and a couple of bicycles and sort of ticking of spokes and things like that um, going on. But yeah, it's a very sort of like, tick, 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 you know, this, this kind of um, frequency. I think this general low hum, I mean, we're so dominated by machinery now. It really, um, it seems overwhelming. I find it, yeah. I live. Um, uh, I used to, uh, well. I live on our farm. We live not far from the road, as you can hear. And at weekends, um, motorbikes come past, and a lot of Harley Davidson groups, and they go down to Margate on sort of charity runs or whatever it might be. And it's just so, it's so overwhelmingly oppressive. And I, I don't think that they should necessarily. Well, I'd be better if they did on electric ones, but it doesn't quite have the same effect. But the sort of the sh the sense of a shared space, that we're sharing a space together, we haven't negotiated that at all well. So for example, um, if when we walk out onto the street, everything will have been thought about how it looked, but you know, including the council will be involved in signs, placing and, and, and how everything might look. But absolutely no thought really has gone into how it sounds other than don't have a nightclub here or don't, uh, when you come out of a pub, please be quiet for your neighbours or something like that. But there's no sense of what echoing might do or like foot, you know, or what cars echoing off of these large buildings or whether they should be planting trees to baffle some of the sound or things like that. So we're living in a very kind of cacophonous, poorly designed urban environment and I, and I think that's goes back to the sense of we should be pursuing some sense of harmony I think whatever yeah, that might yeah. be I couldn't agree more thanks um, do we have time for another question yeah we do great so there are a few hands up can can we have all of the questions or <laughs> two questions all of them at the same time um, we can have two questions so right at the back and then nearer the front. Um, in your going through of the different senses, you only talk about um, sound, or hearing and vision. Um, and coming back to your opening example of the fruit that gives us knowledge, I was very struck by the contrast of we, we hear tactilely. There's a haptic experience um, and I just wanted to given that that hasn't been thematized except in the sense of being moved <laughs> uh, touched uh, whether you want, might have something to say with regard to that um, not least insofar as that maybe I think to come back to the question of t the temporality of hearing um, yeah it's interesting I hadn't thought about that and I I said as a as a unrelated as a related but not answering your question um, thing. I, I was thinking about smell as well, which is presumably in the next that'll be our next new sense. You know, we don't know what the past smelt like, and um, presumably in the future we'll be able to record smell and capture smell, and then and that goes even faster. That bypasses the amygdala. Is that right? Is that right? brain person will know more than me, but it, that goes even faster to the brain and, and how it processes. Um, but that, um, 
I mean, can I think about that? Because no, no one's asked me that before, and that's an interesting thought. I'd like to think about that. Yes. But it's also so interesting because you, you in a way, you talk about it all the time. <laughs> it's just so implicit in your in your speaking. I think that's why it was drawn out as a question. How you do know. you mean? Sorry. Um, I think in in the way that you talk about. Um, our relationship with sound and actually how it can bring us closer to experiences, almost close enough to touch. Um, and because sound is vibrational, because even when I'm speaking, I have to say the microphone confuses this point I'm about to make. Mm -hmm. That as I'm speaking, the, the, the sound is coming to you in, in waves. So in a way, when it's made, when it's manifested, in, when it's materialized in your ear, it's, it's, it's a relationship of touch even at a distance. Yeah, and I think, I guess that's my, my multi-celled organism thing at the beginning about it being mm -hmm. our very first sense. Yeah. But then I also feel like time is like, I also feel like time is like that, like a sort of series of croutons and that we're just sort of, <laughs> <laughs> but that we're all, the, well, it's like a soup, we're all living yeah. in a soup and then these islands or these moments and that we're, <laughs> that we're <t> <laughs> so it's just I, love, I love that as an analogy, but seeing as when we met, just here about an hour or so ago, I told you how I've recently become gluten free. So I wouldn't be able to participate. <laughs> in my I wouldn't be able to participate in, my, uh, in the crouton, crouton soup. soup. I don't think I've explained my theory very well. <laughs> I think I might need to uh, come back. But we do one. have one last question, which I think was in the middle. And I'm, and if, if oh, one here and one here, oh. but also, oh. and there's also, and there's an online question. There are so many, but also I must say that after this last question, we can also go and join Matthew socially, sociably, very close enough to touch, <laughs> upstairs and have a drink with him. So you should definitely be prioritized, those who haven't asked a question. Can we have the online then? I'm so sorry, <laughs> sorry to others. Thank you, yeah, I have a question uh, from a YouTube user with the username El Ruido es el mensaje. Excuse my Spanish. Uh, he says, they say, Matthew, what do you consider to be the importance of noise and silence in your sound work or in your life? Well, um, I, I, I think that distinction is probably um, that's sort of gone for me, probably, that distinction between what's noise and what's silence and what is sound worth preserving. I think one of the one of the real issues um, that I have had as a sound recordist is all you be because when you get the, the sound file into your computer, you can see a little thing that goes, hello, hello. Uh, one nil to Germany, and you get a huge spike here. And the first thing you do when you edit is you get rid of all the stuff at the front. You go right up, neatly up to the hooray. And then as soon as it finishes, you chop the end off. And actually, um, this is a very, again, this is a very selective and unhealthy relationship between the phenomena, I think. I think you need to consider everything from, from the beginning to that part and what happens after it. And you have to you have to consider who recorded it, why they recorded it, the format they recorded it on, why you're hearing it, why it was sent to you, and so on and so forth. And I think that those distinctions between silence and noise and sound, I think, are, sh should be absorbed into one, one word, which tonight will be crouton. <laughs> I think that's a that's a good um, like mic drop word as well, isn't it? Crouton, boof. Don't quite know um, why I started talking about time <laughs> and croutons, but I think it's because music is just. Oh, sorry. Sound and music is just a measure of time. You know, it's mm, time yeah. rendered into something manageable somehow. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew. Wow, what an amazing treat of an evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank also you. to thank the brilliant interpreter. Much appreciated.